If you have over $200,000 sitting stagnant in your bank, retirement account, or home equity, then you're literally losing money. On this show, you learn how to get that money working for you consistently and conservatively. Learn to grow your nest egg with your host, Sean Winslow. Let's dive in. Hey, everyone. I'm Sean Winslow, and this is the Multifamily Money Podcast. Welcome back, everyone. On today's Multifamily Monday show, we're getting into part two of our How to Find Deals in 2022 series. And today we'll be specifically on how to build those relationships with the brokers. If you remember last, last week in part one, we went over you know, your target market, right? How to identify your target market if you don't already have one. And then two, once you have that target market, how to then build a list of brokers that you should be reaching out to. And just to go a quick refresh, we had a couple of different strategies, but at the end of the day, the best one and the one that I think is worth your time is the only one that's worth your time is to get a list from someone like one of your lenders who can provide you data of brokers that are actually doing transactions over the last 12 months. So for me, I reached out to my lender. He is able to run a list of my target markets and brokers that have done transactions in the last 12 months. And then from there, I broke it down and was able to find out, you know, probably what type of transaction, what type of deal, multifamily deal they're doing, because you can take transaction volume, the dollar amount, and then divide the number of units into that, that they sold. And that's tends to give you, you know, a, well, it does give you a dollar per unit sold, which then tends to give you um, a reference of the type of deal. So are they doing a B class, C class, A class, and then you can go from there. So that's what we did. We talked about last week. Now this week, is all about now that once you have that list, what do you do? You know, how do you reach out to them? And how do you, you know, kind of foster that relationship so then that they start sending you good deals? Because we all know we can get on any broker's list. That's not really hard, right? That's not the hard part. They're going to send you all their de- the the deals that are, you know, I don't want to say bottom of the barrel, but the deals that, you know, their 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 top list people have maybe passed on. And so the key is how to actually get to see the deals before anyone else. Because at the end of the day, we can all put our email into a list and we're all going to see you know, deals. But how do we actually see the ones, the good deals first? You know, Now that I've started building relationships with brokers and some I've even transacted with now, now I see deals before anyone else does. You know, they'll just, they'll send me a lot of the times they don't even have a real like official OM, which is an operating memorandum. It's a fancy term for a marketing packet, you know, that has all the pictures and the information that, you know, they're trying to sell. Right. And, and for those that aren't familiar with it, those are, you know, kind of BS, right. It's, you know, anything, it's a marketing packet, right. They're trying to sell you on the deal. So you got to take everything that's in there with a grain of salt, right. You got to do your own due diligence. But the point of that is you get to a point where they're sending you deals before they even really created that offering memorandum because to them, if they're able to show you a deal and then you're able to trend, you know, offer a dollar amount that the seller is happy with, then it's less work that the broker and their team have to go through. Cause they don't even have to go through putting all those official like marketing packets off for it, excuse me, offering memorandums together. They can just essentially, you know, sign a PSA, a purchase sale agreement right from the start and don't have to do all that work. So we call that a being on a short list of an advisor, right? So when you're first starting out, you're probably not going to be able to get on a short list because they don't know know you from you know Joe down the road, right? So they're just going to send you the deals that you know their short list haven't you know gone after, right? So the goal is to be able to get on that short list, you know, top 10, 20 um, teams that these brokers are gonna or groups that these brokers are gonna send their best deals to, right? So once you build that relationship, then they'll start sending you. As soon as they get a deal from a seller that they can put that they can then put under contract with that seller and go turn around and sell, they're going to send it to their short list first, because these are people that they know, like, and trust, and that have done business with them in the past. So they're going to send it to them first, because if any of them bite on it, then that's an easy process for them, because then they can go back to the seller and say, "Hey, we already have a few people that are very interested in this. They've done business with us, so that we know they can perform." You know, we get this under contract quickly without taking it to the entire market. And a lot of times sellers would be like, great. And then, of course, there will be some that like, no, we want it to go 
to the entire market because we wanted to be bid up and see the best price. But a lot of sellers, they just want, because they know time is money, they want the process to go as quickly and it and it's efficiently as possible. So they will, you know, forego going to the entire market to um, put it under contract with someone that the broker has done business before that's comfortable with and know that can perform. All right. So but how do the point of this episode is Sean, how do we get to that point, right? How do we get it to the point where we can be on the short list? And obviously transacting is a big part of that. Yeah, but Sean, like, you know, it's like the chicken before the egg. Like, how can I transact, you know, without being on their short list and without them being, you know, comfortable with us because I need to transact first. And there's a few answers to that. One is like leveraging someone who's transacted in the past, right? So you could have like a mentor or just someone who's done deals that wants to partner with someone, someone like you. And then you can leverage their experience, their background and say, look, my partner here that'll be partnering on this deal with me has transacted X amount of units, X amount of dollars. Um, and if you're really lucky, maybe they've done business with that broker team or another team in their office. Um, <clears throat> that's when you get really lucky. One of my first deals, that's what happened. And we didn't even really know it at first either. They, they had actually, they actually saw a deal on our credibility kit, our marketing packet of the deals we'd done in the past, my, <clears throat> myself and my partner. And one of the deals that was on there was a deal that their student housing team had sold my partner like several years ago. So they knew that deal. So then they knew my partner was like legit could perform. And so then they took us very seriously without having personally done business with us. Like someone in their team, I mean, someone in their office had done business with us before, but they hadn't personally. So leveraging those relationships is key in this business in every aspect of this business, you know, from obviously getting a deal under contract with a broker and a seller, that's very vital, but also from a lending perspective, you know, cause the lenders, you know, when you're first starting out, you're going to have to partner with someone, right? Someone, which we call a sponsor of the deal, someone that, you know, puts up their experience, puts up their net worth. So you can qualify for that, for that loan on the deal. So this whole, this whole business, this whole game is about partnering. There's very few, if, if any, that really do it on their own. Obviously you can get to a certain point where you get so big, you probably can, but even some of the big guys out there, big, big guys and gals out there, they, they're still partnering. I, I see it all the time. And that's what I really love about this business because I love partnering with people. It's a team sport. I love that. Um, so that's what really gets, you know, my kind of my juices flowing and one of the things I love about this business. All right. So <clears throat> enough of me just rambling on here. Let's, let's talk about the good stuff that you came here. Part two. All right, Sean. So like, how do I go about doing this? So like I mentioned before, I have a PDF I put together. It's kind of um, step-by-step actions that I take when building relationships that I will give you um, a way to get this. And part three next week, I will give you um, how to get that resource. And I would just use it. I would just step-by-step. -step. It's worked for me. I know it's worked for other people. I, I would use it. Obviously, tweak it to fit you because you want to be original. You want to be authentic to your own self. Um, but yeah, I, I would highly recommend downloading it once I, once I give you a way to do that. It's worked for me. I know it's worked for others. All right, here we go. So you have your list of brokers in your target markets. And now let's start reaching out to them. Now, one thing I will preface in saying is if you're not familiar with the lingo of commercial real estate, I would familiar, familiarize yourself with that because it is very different from normal lingo. Even if you're in residential real estate, it is different, very different. Um, Ways I would, what I would do to get familiar with it, obviously YouTube videos, podcasts, which you're obviously here listening to a podcast. You've probably heard me use some of that lingo. There's books out there. And then once you've kind of get familiar with the lingo, and I could even do it, if any of you are really need to get familiar with the lingo, you know, leave a, a comment or reach out to me on Instagram or LinkedIn and let me know. And I can do a whole episode on lingo. That's something I definitely can do. Just let me know. But a good way to practice this once you kind of feel com comfortable with the lingo is reach out to a broker that's not in your market. So pick another market, reach out to a couple, just 
you know, to have a conversation, right. And get comfortable with it. And I don't take up too much of their time and don't do this to too many brokers. Cause we don't want to waste anyone's time. That's not what I'm here to do. But, you know, I, th- I think it is good for you to get comfortable talking with them, the, the lingo. And, and I will preface this too. different parts of the country use different terminology and not, you know, I I've realized that too. I'll be talking with a broker in the Southeast and it's really different from a broker from where I'm in the Northeast of, of what, you know, terms they use. They all mean, <laughs> it's just one of those things in finances that we try to make it harder on ourselves than it needs to be. We use all these, like, you know, all this lingo, all these acronyms that are just unnecessary. You know, it's one of those things people try to, you know, make themselves sound smarter than they are. It, to me, it's just stupid, but yeah, anyways, don't get frustrated and, the lingo is a little different in different parts of the territory, but it it's really easy to realize what they're actually saying. If you know, if you know some set of the lingo, right? So yeah, reach out to brokers that are not in your market a couple of times and get familiar with it. But again, don't do it too much. Okay. Once you've done that now, here are the actionable steps, right? So you're going to put an email together and actually in this resource, I'm going to give out to you in part three next week, I have an email template. Obviously, use it, not use it. Or if you do use it and you want to kind of tweak it to, to, you know, your lingo, I would recommend doing that to make it authentic, but essentially the email is just going to introduce yourself, um, what you're looking for specifically, what type of property and, you know, and then you're going to ask, you know, do you have anything that fits this description? Now I will get I'll do my underwriting analysis, get back to you within whatever hours you want to put. I usually put 72 hours just because life happens and I don't like to put 24 or 48 because I want to be a man of my word and I don't, you know, some, that's tough to do sometimes 24 and 48 hours. So then I say that, um, and then I, I attach our credibility kit to it. Um, and that's something we can also talk about too in a future episode. Like what is your credibility kit? How do you build one? When I first started out, I leveraged my partner that I was going to do my first couple of deals with. I leveraged his background. I think that's very smart to do, you know, cause he, he had been in it for over 15 years, the game, the business, and we were going to do our, my first couple of deals with, with him. So it, you know, it made sense to do that. So I will give the actual email and that resource that you can download. So you send the email introducing yourself and be, be a little specific, right? Like I would say, I'm, I'm looking for originally, I was saying I'm looking for hundred to 250 units. Now it's probably more, I'm looking for, you know, 150 to 300 you know, B class to, you know, C plus to to B plus class properties, Um, value add, you know, I'd say medium value add, not light, but not heavy lift. We like secondary and tertiary markets. We will take a look at primary markets, Um, pitch roofs, garden style, townhomes, et cetera. You want to be clear, right? Obviously you can leave a lot of that to the the phone conversation or the in-person meeting. You don't want to go the email to be too long, but you'll see it in my template. Um, and so you're going to send that email and then you're going to make the call and you're going to call the broker like immediately. Maybe might give it five minutes to let it hit the inbox. I'm going to call them, introduce yourself again, reiterate, you know, who you are, what you're looking for, um, reference that you had sent an email. You just wanted to get touch in person. And then once you state what you're looking for and being specific, I like to turn the conversation then to something personal. I don't like, I like it probably to be 80% personal, 20% business. Um, Cause they're getting calls all day long about business. And, and that just feels like take, 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 like want, want, want. Like I like to come to a, a place of adding value and building a relationship on a personal level than like a take, take, take. So turn the co- conversation on to them. You know, like people in general love to talk about themselves. And you probably realize that if you can get someone to talk about themselves, they'll talk, 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 talk. And obviously that's one reason you're doing it right. Cause you want them to feel comfortable with you and people like talking about themselves, but two, you also want to see if you can pick up any on anything where you guys have any interests in common, any activities in common. Maybe you like cars, maybe you're a golfer, maybe you like to ski, travel, um, charities, whatever it happens to be, find those common interests and then continue the conversation built on that. And that's something in the future that you can keep hitting on. So say they like cars, they like golf. Every time you talk to them, you're going to bring up that topic. Maybe they just had kids and they're a big family person. You're going to hit on that, ask them about their family. Every time you talk to them, continue to 
grow that relationship. And eventually it's going to get to a point, or at least it should get to a point where you're having like a, a texting relationship. Like I'll send some of my brokers, like I know if they're a sports fan, like congratulations on your team winning world series or whatever it happens to be. Um, how, how's the little guy doing? They just, if they just had a kid, just continue to build that relationship. Cause at the end of the day, I'm sure all of you like me want to be in this business for a long time. So if I'm, I want to be in this business for a long time. So I want to be in a business with people that I'm having fun with, that I enjoy for a long time. Right. And that goes back to not only building relationship with guys that are doing business now, that's obviously you should be focused on from the jump because you don't want to waste your time and you want to obviously get a deal as soon as possible. You should also be building relationships with some of the younger guys on the teams because the cool thing about it is as your career grows, as your business grows, you're going to be growing you know, with them as their career grows. And that's just going to be powerful for, for your business and for them. Um, so yeah, you're going to have this conversation. You're going to try to find things um, that you relate to. And then at the end of the conversation, you're going to tell them that you plan on traveling to the territory on X date. Um, do they have time to meet for coffee or lunch? Your treat. Obviously say that because, you know, a lot of people will go out with brokers. The brokers will pay for it, right? Because, you know, they can expense it, but offer to pay for them. Um, and then obviously reference that email you just sent, has your contact info. And then after, obviously after the call, once you lock down that date, send a follow-up email, thank them for their time today. And then again, reference the meeting and send, you know, like a calendar in, invite. And then if they did not pick up, obviously, which will happen, just keep, keep trying, keep calling. It's, it's ever like anything in life. It's all in the follow-up. So many people don't follow up and that's why they don't get anywhere. Very few people follow, follow up. So if you continue to follow up, you're going to one, set yourself apart from the jump. And then two, you're eventually going to get them and start building that relationship. And then, you know, if you just like, feel like you're beating your head on the, on the desk, on the wall, and you're just not getting anywhere. It's a little trick that I've used a couple of times where I'll send like a gift card, like say a Starbucks or some type of coffee gift card saying like, Hey, so-and-so I haven't been able to get a hold of you. Here's coffee on me. Next time I'd like the coffee on me to be in person. Here, here's my phone number or here's my email. And if you send that to them, they're going to call you. <laughs> like, trust me, they're going to call you. And then you can set up a meeting, right? And, and do that initial conversation. Um, so you've done that. You've set the meeting. Now you're going to go and meet them. And especially, so if, if, you're, if you live in your target market, if that's your backyard, obviously it's easier. But if not, you're going to have to get on a plane, fly down there. And it just sets yourself apart because there's so many people out there, even, even like some of the bigger players, you know, they're just firing off emails and phone calls and waiting until they get a bite on a deal they like, right? And so these brokers are just getting inundated with calls and emails. And there's even times where I've gone to tour deals. And there was one time specifically where they told me I was the only one that had looked at at this point and they've already had offers. And, you know, the bro brokers don't like that. They like you to actually come and see the deal. That, that means a lot. Like one, that you're serious. Two, they actually want you to see the deal because they don't want to give to go into contract with someone who hasn't seen the deal. And then the person comes and does the due diligence and they see all these things they don't like, and then they want to renegotiate on the price. That's the biggest thing. So like if I've, if I go and see the deal beforehand, beforehand, I've seen some of the, the big things that I might, you know, then put in, in what my negotiation for the price, what my offer is going to be. Right. So they're, they know like, well, Sean's not going to then try to hit us on this and renegotiate the price, retrade the price, which that's a lingo retrade. Um, he's not going to want to retrade because he's, he's seen it. So that makes them feel very comfortable. So they like that. That just, it's a little side note, but that just blows my mind that some people still don't go visit a property before they submit an offer. And it's not even just that. It's the fact that you don't get the feel of the property and how it flows until you go there. And that can make a huge change. One, if you even want to make an offer, but two on what your offer is going to be. All right. So fly out there, meet them, and it really does go a long way. I remember one of my earlier meetings with a broker. I was in Tampa. It was on a Friday, I want to say. 
I was in Orlando the day before. So I, I drove down, met with him and he like asked, he's like, so what brings you to Tampa? You doing, you doing something fun this weekend? And I'm like, no, I flew down here to meet with you. And he was just like blown away. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I flew down here to see you and, and other brokers I had meetings with because I really want to do business with you and your team in this market. And that really goes a long way because you're setting yourself apart. You're actually, one, you're spending money, you're taking time to actually go down there and meet them without any prospect of doing a deal, without even seeing a deal. Trust me, it goes a long way. All right, so in this meeting, obviously, again, you want the majority of the conversation to be about them and more personal stuff so you can build that relationship. Um, and <clears throat> obviously, there's going to be time where you want to talk business because they, they don't want it just to be a waste of time either, right? They want to know what type of stuff you're looking for. So again, bring up the type of deals, get very specific so they know what to send you when they have it. Um, and then this is one question I always like to ask is ask them about their favorite buyers they sell properties to. What do these investors do to be their favorite? How do they operate? How do they interact with the broker? And, and get all those like details, like who's their, their favorite. Like Have them imagine in their head who their favorite buyer is and what do they do. And then set the expectations that you will interact with them just like their favorite buyer does. And to me, that goes a long way. Like I've had people like kind of be like, shocked that I've said, like shocked in a good way, right? Like taking it back a little bit. Um, and sometimes if you're lucky, they'll, they'll, they'll want to show you a D, if they have one right then and there. And they're like, do you have time to go check this with me later today? And obviously make sure you do have time because that's further building a relationship and showing them that you're really serious. Um, so after that meeting, meeting is over, hopefully maybe you got to see a deal, but if not, either way, it's still success. Um, after the meeting, what I do is I send a handwritten letter, um, again, thanking them for meeting with you. And sometimes I'll also send like a Starbucks gift card if I hadn't before, just, you know, thank them for their time. I'd love to get a coffee with you again in the future. In the meantime, here's another one, right? Um, looking forward to doing business with you. And then they're going to start sending you deals. And the important part where a lot of people fail is they only follow up on the deals that they think may work, right? So if you get a deal like, oh, this one could work, then they follow up on them. Again, that comes from a take, 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 take. And also then the broker doesn't really know what to send you. And they, they think they should just send you everything because, right? Mm -hmm. But it's more important to follow up on the ones that don't work than the ones that do and let them know why it doesn't work for you. One, they really appreciate that. And then two, they know okay, that type of deal is not for him or her. This is the more type of deal. So I know that I don't have to waste each other's time. This whole thing is about one, building a relationship, but two, trying not to waste the broker's time because they're busy just like anyone else. And the fact that these guys and gals only get paid when they sell. So it's even more important that you don't waste their time because they're out there trying to make a sale so they can get paid. So that's very important. Follow up on those deals that don't even work, work for you. Um, and then I would make up a, a follow-up call, you know, maybe, maybe once a month. And then maybe you think it, if you're more comfortable doing it more, that's fine. Maybe twice a month, but don't like, you know, inundate them with calls, especially before you've really done anything. And then try to, if you hadn't already toured a deal with them, try to tour deal with them as quickly as possible. Cause it just keeps things flowing, keeps you at the top of mind, you know, shows that you're really serious about doing this and <clears throat> that you're really serious about getting a deal with them. And so, and then once you find one, submit an LOI. Cause that, again, that's just another step that oh, this person really is serious. This person really wants to get a deal. Obviously just don't fire off any old LOI. If, if a deal doesn't make sense for you or really undercut them, you know, lowball them. Don't do that. Like once you get one that's close, even if you don't think you're going to win, still submit it, you know, get your name in the ring. And if they really like you, they might even tell you like, hey, if you can do this and this, I'm going to get you the best final. And once you're in best and final, hey, if you can do this, I can get you to the finish line. Trust me, it works. Because one of the things I realized early on is that once you do start getting LOI submitted, especially in, not necessarily in the first round, but in best and final, they go into this matrix that brokers have of lists, especially within their own brokerage, firm, brokerage house um, that other teams can see. So once they can consistently see your business's name in there, your name in there, they're going to be like, oh, this person's legit. Like I'm going to add them to my list. I'm going to send them deals. 
it works because I've seen it work, especially after you close your first deal, then it really works. I don't know if you ever heard of the term, the law, the first deal, something Michael, Michael Blanc, I'm not trying to steal it, but it's something that he really talks on. And it's that once you close your first deal, like then everyone knows you're legit. Like it just like, it just explodes. Like everyone sees and you got other brokers reaching out to you with deals. You've got lenders reaching out. To you. You've got all different types of vendors that interact with in the real estate space, reaching out to you because they want to, they want to get a, you know, slice of the action because they know, they know you can perform. They know you can close. Um, so yeah. So don't think just, even if you submit an LOI and you're not winning, it, you know, that it's, it's bad. There's, there's still a little silver lining. Obviously you want to win the, the deal, but there is a little silver lining that it, it still gets your name out there to an extent. Um, and then this is kind of looking forward, but the fact that I just want to look into like, if you were to get one accepted, really do your best to make the process go as quickly and smoothly as possible. Obviously, you got to do your due diligence and do what's best for yourself and your investors, but you want it to go as quickly and smoothly as possible because the broker will really appreciate them. Again, it's less work they have to do. And again, they only make money when a deal closes, right? So they, they want to get paid clearly. So they want something to go quickly and smoothly. And I remember my first, first deal, it, we were fortunate enough where there was no big, you know, like headaches or, or snap or any, anything wrong that came. So came up within due diligence. So we were able to go smoothly and quickly. And he was super appreciative. Like after he called me congratulating after the deal closed, he said, Hey, me and, and the team just want to thank you. This was you know, one of the easiest transactions we've ever had. This is exactly what we're looking for when we're dealing with a buyer. So thank you. So trust me, it goes a long way. And they're going to want to do more deals with you because they know how easy you are to operate with. So they're going to be like, even if you're not the, the best offer and a best and final, they're going to push you as hard as they can for the, the seller to accept your offer because they know how, you know, how easy it is to work with you. And, they, and that's what they want. All right. So after that meeting, again, you got a handwritten letter to them following up continuously and trying to get to her a deal as soon as possible. All right. Now I've gotten into a lot. So part three is going to be more about fostering that relationship. And then once you close, what to keep doing, because even though you close, that's still not the end all be all. Yes, it matters a lot and it means a lot but there's still a lot of other people out there that close too. And just like with anything in life, especially in, in today's day and age where we're just getting inundated with so much information and data coming at us from, you know, text, emails, social media, just everything that it's so hard to stay top of mind. So even if you close on a deal, you still want to be able to stay top of mind. Right. And so next, next week's part three is going to be like, all right, once you get to that point, like how do I still stay top of mind? What are kind of some kind of the strategies to do so? And so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so I, I hope this wasn't too long, um, but I think it's very, this is one part that's very important about the, um, about this business. Obviously it's the deals, right? It's deals and money. And that also brings up another topic. I've had several listeners reach out, reach out to me like they, they love that this series we're doing now, but they also had questions on raising money. So I think I'm going to do a series on that in the near future on raising money. Cause that's obviously the other part. It's the deals and the money. Those are the two big things. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Obviously, if you ever have any questions, you guys just reach out to me, Instagram, which is Shauna wins and LinkedIn. Both links are always in the show notes. So take a look at that. Feel free to reach out if you ever have any questions on anything I'm going over or just want to connect. You know, I always love talking real estate to anyone and everyone. So please feel free to reach out. So I hope this was helpful. As always, thank you for tuning in. It means the world to me and I hope I'm bringing you value. And as always, if I am, please share this show with someone else that I can also bring value to. That would be great. All right, everyone, catch you on the next one. Hey, this is Sean Winslow. After being in the financial service industry for years and having candid conversations with good people just like you, I realized that so many of us are wanting an investment strategy that provides solid returns and consistent income without the bumps in the road. There's little known secret that your financial advisor doesn't want you to know. There is investment out there that is less volatile and the returns are stronger. 
Get more details by going to greenbriarcg.com and clicking on the free e-report. And by the way, if this show has provided you any value, then feel free to leave an honest written review and of course, share it with a friend who needs it. See you next week for another great show.